The Richard and Judy Book Club with twists and turns, joy and woe, and one or two happy ever afters. Exclusive to WH Smith. You may not know the voice, but I guarantee you'll recognize the name. Well, I'll never forget the frustration 30 years ago of trying to write my first novel and walking into bookstores and seeing, you know, a huge wall of 50 new releases from the publishers in New York and London. And I would think to myself, you know, who wants to hear from me? John Grisham joins us from the US to talk about Rogue Lawyer. My name is Sebastian Rudd, and though I am a well-known street lawyer, you will not see my name on billboards, on bus benches, or screaming at you from the yellow pages. I don't pay to be seen on television, though I am often there. My name is not listed in any phone book. I do not maintain a traditional office. I carry a gun, legally, because my name and face tend to attract attention from the type of people who also carry guns and don't mind using them. I live alone, usually sleep alone, and do not possess the patience and understanding necessary to maintain friendships. The law is my life always consuming and occasionally fulfilling. I wouldn't call it a jealous mistress, as some forgotten person once so famously did. It's more like an overbearing wife who controls the checkbook. There's no way out. I really liked the central character of this book, a guy called Sebastian Rudd. He's he's this this geezer, this lawyer, who who takes cases that nobody else is going to touch. He defends anyone accused of the vilest of crimes, he's just interested, really, in the legal process and justice and turning an honest dollar. And he just doesn't give a damn about what people think of him as a consequence of representing the lowest of the low. But he thinks enough to take the precaution of carrying a gun, and he employs a very heavily armed driver come bodyguard. Um, and of course, in this latest case, this this guy Rudd, Sebastian Rudd, he needs all the protection he can get. Um, it's It's another cracking thriller from a bloke who's just made this genre his own, hasn't he, John Grisham? Yeah, um, yeah. He's, Rudd is known as a street lawyer, isn't he? That's right. They're the sort of the, the lowest of the low, are they? They feed out of the gutter. Take any, yeah. And he doesn't, does he not really care about whether uh, his clients are innocent or not? No, nope, he's interested in the process. Uh, he believes that everybody's entitled to a fair trial, uh, that the legal system would collapse if you didn't have that as a basic tenet. So even if someone's accused of the worst kind of paedophilic crime, someone's got to defend them and he'll do the job. Mm. Fascinating. I love John Grisham. So much more than your average book club. This is the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. John Grisham, Rogue Lawyer. I had dreamed of being a tax lawyer until I went to law school and actually studied tax law and realized how um, terrible the tax code is over here. And I guess I, I can never do that for the rest of my life. You know, I, I've got to find something else in the law. And I, I became a, a dreamed of being a small town trial lawyer who spent a lot of time in the courtroom. And I was on that track when I sort of, uh, not, not accidentally, but just, um, I had the idea of trying to write a novel and, and when I was about 30 years old, and it was based on something I'd seen in a courtroom that inspired me to create this drama that I thought would be a really great case, as seemed to the eyes of a young lawyer in a small town in Mississippi, pretty much the life I was living. I, at, that, at that time, I was dreaming of the big case, the big trial, you know, all the notoriety, and so that was the story, and I just, for some reason, one day started writing it, and I'd never written before, and Three years later, it was finished. The Time to Kill did not sell. Turns out it's been the best-selling book of all of them and still selling very well. Published in 1989, uh, so what's 27 years ago now, and it was uh, difficult to get it published. It was rejected by a lot of publishers, which is not unusual in publishing. And uh, uh, I was disappointed by that. And I, and I, I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm going to write one more book. And if this book does not sell and is if, not, if it's not worth the time and effort, uh, that's it. This career is over. I'm going to forget about writing and just be a lawyer. And But the second book uh, was The Firm, and that changed everything. What is it about the uh, the tough, principled loner, the hired gun with a conscience that appeals to you so much, John? 
Probably because for a number of years I fancied myself as that person when I was a small town lawyer in Mississippi and my clients were poor and working people and, um, you, you know, we were always fighting against insurance companies and banks and the big guys. And so I, I identified with the little guy and, uh, always enjoyed, uh, the few times we were actually, to, actually able to prevail in a trial or in a case, but I always enjoyed that role as the protector of the person who didn't have any money. You've written so much stuff in this particular you know, style and genre. Um, when you finish one of these books, do you sometimes kind of think, I don't think I've got any more left in me on this? Not yet. Uh, I've been lucky. I keep waiting for a severe case of writer's block. Uh, it has not hit me yet. Although after about 15 legal thrillers, uh, I, I did begin thinking, well, could I write something else? And so I did. I wrote I wrote a, um, a book called uh, A Painted House, which has no lawyers anywhere in the book. It's a, sort of a childhood memoir. I've written a comic novel about Christmas. I've written two books about football, one book about baseball, and I can't think of and that. Now I've written some kids' books. So I don't get bored with the legal thriller. I still enjoy writing those books. But I think e any writer begins to question, you know, can, can, I, can I do something else? Is police and judicial corruption and venality really as bad in some American states as you portray it here? It is bad in some places, yes. And it's bad. It, it should be. Uh, we should be able to fix it everywhere because because a lot of the incompetence and corruption that leads to wrongful convictions in cases like that could easily be preventable if we simply had the uh, the backbone to do it. Uh, I practiced law for 10 years in a small town in Mississippi. I never had a client I thought was wrongfully convicted. The, our system ran fine. Uh, so I think in most I think in most American jurisdictions, small cities, I mean uh, big cities, small towns, small can rural areas. For the most part, the system does okay and not great, but it certainly could be fixed. I mean this in the most respectful and affectionate way, Mr. Grisham, but you have been going for a very, very long time. Do you think that when they bury you, you will actually be having a pen or a laptop held, grasped in your hand? No, probably a golf club. Uh, I'll probably be on a golf course somewhere and uh, taking it easy when I pass away. And I'm not going to worry about it when I die, what they say about me when, I, when I'm gone, because I'll be gone. I'm, I don't care then. Seeing your books on the bookshelves of Smith's is just, it's extraordinary because it's so familiar to everyone, so much a part of British High Street, I think it's an extraordinary thing to walk past and to see, you know, I, there was a poster in the window in my local Smith's and that was a, an extraordinary thing. When I found out about the massive excitement of being in this Rich and Judy book club, I was telling my parents about it and my husband chimed in to say to my dad, he said, you know it'll be in the window of all the all the WH Smiths in the country when it's its week. And my dad said, what, even in Falmouth, <laughs> which is where they live. <laughs> so it is much appreciated in our family and my husband and son are really looking forward to walking down Chiswick High Street and having a sconce in the window of our WH Smiths. All writers have this sort of guilty secret. We all go into bookstores and we quietly walk along the aisles so we find our own books and say, just to just confirm that there are some there on the shelves. But when the book first comes out, you'll always go to W. Smith's on your high street and you'll find your book sitting there and have a little quiet smile yourself and then, then slink out again. More thrilling than it is embarrassing. So much so that I will actually go and stand next to a display and um, take a little selfie. <laughs> so I can't be so embarrassed. But there is a moment when you don't want other people to see you swanning around your own books or moving them to other parts of the shop, which I'd never do. Um, nose grows. It's still very uh, rewarding and gratifying to walk into a bookstore and see my books there because I still, I'll never forget the frustration 30 years ago of trying to write my first novel Still, when I walk in a bookstore, I always look around. I always go find my books wherever they are, in, in London or Paris or Rome or New York, wherever I happen to be. I want to find my books, and it's still a whole lot of fun. I'll never forget the first time I went on holiday after my first novel came out, sitting in the in the airport with all my friends. We were waiting to go on a big group holiday together, and walking past W. H. Smith and seeing my book there with all the big holiday reads and all my friends clustered round cooing and getting terribly excited about it it's just it's an unbeatable thrill every single time it's so thrilling to see my my book on the shelves at w smith's i can't actually quite believe that that is a thing that is that it's happened for i'm a debut writer it's 
really is a dream come true. I'm kind of still staggered by it. Um, I'm going to have lots of pictures of me in bookshelves. If you see a woman posing by bookshelves in W.H. Smith's, it will be me with my, th- my fingers up, looking joyous and happy. The writing routine has not varied much in many years. It's very strict and it's very disciplined. I start each morning at 7 o'clock uh, with um, a strong cup of coffee in the same spot, the same office, the same chair, the same quilt, the same um, computer, although I changed computers about 10 years ago. And I write very hard from uh, about 7 a.m. until about 10 a.m., take a break and then go back for a couple of hours. So it's normally four or five hours uh, a day for five days a week. Well, my favorite part of writing a book is uh, is when the thing is finally done and it gets published. The uh, the writing itself is, um, you know, it's lonely. It's a one-man job. You can't really collaborate when you write a novel. Uh, it's not always enjoyable, although I do still enjoy piecing the plots together for an intricate thriller, a legal thriller. That's still enjoyable. I still enjoy thinking about stories I might want to write about or issues I might want to cover in books. Uh, after 37 or 38 books, I'm still having a lot of fun. Being able to do it uh, full-time, uh, it's a full-time job and not as a part-time job as I did for a few years, and being able to write books that uh, people enjoy, that a lot of people enjoy around the world. It's still very difficult for me to understand, hard for me to grasp that I can write a book here in the U.S. in Virginia where I live and watch that book uh, be translated into now. 46 or 47 languages around the world and people in many countries um, enjoy the books. That's, that's extremely gratifying. And, you know, I have a lot of favorite books, but I can't tell you um, which book I would recommend. I, the, the book I've probably read and reread the most is a, is a book called The Grapes of Wrath by, by John Steinbeck, which was published in 1939, and he won the Pulitzer for it that year, later the Nobel. It's still one of my favorite books. Coming up next time, Dawn French. I absolutely was, yes, in Manhattan. I lived round the corner from where I have set this novel because I know that area. And I was a little bit worried that the Manhattan I knew when I was 18, which was, how long ago was that? 1970-something, that it would be very different to the Manhattan today. But in fact, when I did my research and went back, that area, the Upper East Side of New York, does not change. (laughs) So come back soon for another special Richard and Judy Book Club podcast. Take the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast wherever you go for reading inspiration.